Hello, and welcome to Wesley United Methodist Church of Trenton, Missouri. Our church is located at 113 East 9th Street, which is on the corner of 9th and Washington in Trenton, Missouri. You can call our office between the hours of 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday through Friday at 660-359-6762, or visit our website at wesleyunitedmethodist.us. Now we invite you to open your heart, mind, and body to the Word of God with Rev. Barry Bulware. I'm going to read now our scripture, which is assigned for today. It is found in the 34th chapter of the Book of Psalms, and I'm going to read from uh, the message, which is Eugene Peterson's translation. Come, children, listen closely. I'll give you a lesson in God. Worship. Who out there has a lust for life? Can't wait each day to come upon something next that is beautiful? Well, guard your tongue from profanity and no more lying through your teeth. Turn your back on sin. Do something good. Embrace peace. Don't let it get away. May God truly bless reading of this holy word. Lecturing to a crowd in Denver one day, Rabbi Joseph Toluska looked out at the audience and said, how many of you grew up in a household in which somebody's ill temper had a bad effect upon the family? And immediately there was this hand on the front row that came up and then the person sitting next to that person raised their hand. Guess who raised their hands? The six-year-old daughter of the rabbi and his younger sister. <laughs> this rabbi, as some of you will know, is the author of the book, Words That Hurt and Words That Heal. No doubt the same can be said about any one of our families. You can't be a family without at some point in time something offends someone else. Words that were used or the manner in which they were spoken. The truth is this. There are many sins in the world that you will never commit. Never. But every one of us has spoken words from time to time that become regrettable down the road. And every one of us has known someone else's words to hit a raw spot within us. Yes, my parents, like so many of yours, used to say to me, they really did, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Mom, Dad, the first time that I've ever said this in a sermon. You were wrong. Words can hurt. But the good news is that words can heal as well. Today's text is a direct hit upon our theme. It is found in the book of Psalms. Let me now read the uh, New International Translation Version. Come, my children, listen to me. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn your back on sin, do something good, seek peace and pursue it, and don't let it get away. You see, the psalmist is drawing a parallel between words that we speak and peace that we can find between those two things. Think about that. If we want to know peace, the kind of peace that Jesus can give us, and he promises it as we have repeated over and over through all of the sermons in this theme, where he says, my peace I give to you speaking to his disciples. If 
we want to know that kind of peace, we will need to pay attention to our speech. In today's litigious society, where lawsuit after lawsuit gets filed, someone is always claiming to be offended. Today's message is not a case against telling the truth, not even backing down from the truth. Sometimes the truth will irritate another person. No, I'm not in any way suggesting that we go around walking on eggshells, simply straddling the fence at every turn, never standing up for what is true and right out of fear that someone somewhere will take offense of what we have to say. There's too much of that. Jesus was not somebody's wimp. And if he had something to say, well, that would be offensive to others, he would speak it to their face, and he'd spoke it in truth, and then he'd move on. How often Jesus would address those who considered themselves to be the elitist of the society by calling them, you hypocrites. And then he would expose their hypocrisy. Truth telling must not be a casualty of political correctness, neither should it be lost in translation by the manner in which it is expressed. Jesus was a master with words, and yet he was careful with his words. He didn't intentionally go out to hurt someone with the words that he chose. But on the other hand, he would speak the truth. He often told parables to express his point without even having to make his point. Just the parable itself would suffice. Have you ever wondered why the Bible repeatedly refers to Jesus as the Word? And the Word is always capitalized when it is used this way. Well, it is called, he is called the Word because he perfectly communicates God to us. If you ever get confused by certain Old Testament images of God that make him appear to be mean and full of wrath, look at the life of Jesus to understand who God is and just what God is like. He spoke to us not only through his words, but also through all of the events of his life. Everything about him, his birth, miracles, parables, death, resurrection, all of these express the mind and heart of God the Creator. Listen to how the book of Genesis depicts God's creation. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to us. And the dry land appeared. And God said, let the land produce vegetation. And it was so. You see, God spoke words and creation followed. There's power in God's holy words. Listen now to some of Jesus' words. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Get up and take your mat and go home. Jesus said to the waves, Be quiet, be still. And the waves died down. Jesus said in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Exited the tomb. You see the parallels between Jesus' words and our Creator's words when He was creating? God created the world simply by speaking it into being. Jesus recreates through words of healing and restoration. Made in God's image, we are to participate. Jesus' creative and redemptive ways. A teacher who encourages a child to believe that she can succeed. A husband who 
makes a point of commending his wife whenever he can. A man who reinforces his love for his son. For his son. All of these speak words that can be pivotal in another person's life. How we sometimes interpret the facts of any given situation will often determine our response to them. But here's the important thing. How we interpret the facts of any given situation is oftentimes already determined by the way we want those facts to be understood in the first place. And that is precisely what we now see happening in Florida in the George Zimmerman trial. There were minds that were made up before the trial. There were minds made up after the trial. And sometimes those minds are made up because their ideas are already preset before the facts even are laid upon the table. And there's not a one of us that can escape that kind of humanness from time to time. How many times have you been surprised where you have judged someone silently within yourself only to find out down the road, well, that person isn't that kind of person at all. Why didn't I see the goodness in them all along? Here I judged them. I didn't tell anyone about it. Thank you, Lord. But I was dead wrong. That ever happened to you? Boy, that's happened to me. Sometimes people are just lousy at making first impressions. And so other people form an opinion about that person. And oftentimes that opinion is just wrong. It's not accurate at all. That's part of our humanness. That's going to happen to us. I would imagine that this happens to you too. You're watching TV or you're listening to the radio and whoever is speaking says, well, now we're going to bring these two people in to debate this point. And you're familiar with the two people who are coming on. They represent different points of view. Okay? And before they even say a word, you already know what the subject is and what this person is going to say and what that person is going to say and how they're going to get into an argument. You already anticipate. Okay? There are personalities across this nation that we know so well, particularly on television, as they come and give their opinions that we already know what they're going to say beforehand. And I guess what today we're trying to say is, let's not prejudge things as often as we do. We could be wrong. We might be inaccurate. Let's listen more and speak less. That's how divisions in our country happen. When we are quick to speak, and slow to listen. Think how different things would be if those people that we listen to would try to affirm the strong points in the other person's position. And it was like what you and I were saying right before morning worship. We were talking about someone who would strongly disagree with Ed, but always in a loving manner. Think how good that would be if that's how we treated all people, the ones that we even disagree with. We still respect them. We still show them courtesy. We still love them. But we have different points of view. That's how we unite. That's how we bond with other people. There's enough divisiveness already all around us. And the atmosphere of our discussions is every bit as important as the words that we choose to say things. I've learned that one from my mother. Barry, sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it to your father and to me. Guilty. <laughs> Guilty. Isn't it amazing how things we learn as a child have a way of staying within us? They probably stay within us because they struck 
a note of truth. The Amish proverb says, swallowing words before you say them is so much better than having to eat them afterward. And the 17th proverb says, even fools are thought wise when they keep silent with their mouths shut. They seem intelligent. That's just straight out of the Bible. And again, the Peterson translation of 1 James is, post this at all your intersections, dear friends. Lead with your ears, follow up with your tongue, and let anger straggle along in the rear. Once again, the Amish say, blessed are those who have nothing to say and who cannot be persuaded to say it. <laughs> That's just as good as it gets. <laughs> All of these are expressions of wisdom. We know that. The other day, I was reading an intriguing story about a woman who did a most unusual doctor, doctor dissertation at K-State. Her name is Janice Hume. And what she studied were some 8,000 obituaries from various periods of American history. And one of the things that she discovered was a major difference in what was emphasized in the obituaries from the 19th century as opposed to the obituaries of the 20th century. By and large, the obituaries of the 19th century, the 1800s, emphasized the character of the person who had died. Whereas the obituaries of the 20th century emphasized the successes of the person who had died. Hmm. That's quite a difference, isn't it? It was such a stark contrast, Janice Hume said, between remembering someone for the strength of their character from remembering someone from the size of their bank account. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That's just simply not true. Not with children, not with teenagers, not even with adults. How will you want to be remembered long after you're gone? What will your obituary say about you and your character? Our words and the manner in which we speak them will be remembered long after we're gone. Good words, spoken with respect, promote peace. That's just the way things work. Amen. Thank you for joining us on our pre-recorded Sunday morning service. If you would like a copy, you can contact the office at 660-359-6762 or email us at wesleyum at sbcglobal.net. Feel free to visit us in person or online at wesleyunitedmethodist.us where you will always find open hearts, open minds, and open doors. May the blessings of Jesus Christ be upon you in every aspect of your life.